Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Kubernetes Unpacked podcast. My name is Michael Levan. My name is Kristina Devochko. And today we have Adriana Valella on, and we are going to be talking about something that I haven't done yet, which is going to be awesome. Nomad on Kubernetes. How does this whole thing work? I mean, you know, of course, we're going to be diving super in depth in this podcast episode, but Nomad on Kubernetes. I mean, I, I think... Technically, it makes sense to me, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts, uh, you know, at the high level, and then we can definitely dive into it. Yeah, sure. So just one correction. It's the other way around. It's Kubernetes on Nomad. (laughs) Kubernetes on Nomad. I'm sorry. (laughs) No worries. Honestly, the reason why I tried it out is because I thought, why the hell not? (laughs) For no other reason than that. You know, there's like Kelsey Hightower's tutorial of like running Nomad on Kubernetes. And I thought, huh, that's cool. What if you could do it the other way? around (laughs) for funsies and when I was playing around with that concept I was originally going to try to like run v cluster on a nomad because i thought well you know there's like helm charts for that and Mm -hmm. seems pretty straightforward but then i'm like that's a lot of work maybe let's like try to pare it down a bit and see if i can find um a kubernetes distro that's like super lightweight maybe something that can exist in a Docker container that I can just deploy on Nomad and away we go. So after some poking around, I found K zeros, which I'd never worked with before. I'd done some work with Kind, but not K zeros. And the nice thing about K zeros is you can just run it off of a Docker image. So I thought foolishly, hey, that should be pretty easy. (laughs) (laughs) But no, turned out to be not quite so straightforward because it turns out that I went ahead and decided, well, I'll just like, you know, pop this in a Nomad job spec and get this running in Nomad, no problem. And I got it up and running and then realized that like, even though the job deployed correctly, Kubernetes was nowhere to be seen. (laughs) Yeah, it it just refused to launch the kubelet, which is kind of a problem because without the kubelet, ain't got Kubernetes. Uh (laughs) So fortunately, um, I have a friend who actually works at HashiCorp and who is a developer on the Nomad project. And so we paired on it and did some debugging together. And of course, we had to take a step back. I mean, I should have done this in the first place, which is like, hey, how about trying to run it locally on your computer to make sure that K0s actually works? Doi. <laughs> so we did that. And we discovered that, of course, we have M1 Max and all the problems happen around Docker and M1 Max. Ha ha ha. So <laughs> after we sorted out those issues, then we're like, okay, we're ready to port this over to Nomad proper. And then there was a parameter that was required to run this on M1 Max, which was, I think, C group namespace, I think, which is a Docker parameter, but Nomad doesn't support that. Mm. But having friends in HashiCorp pays off because he's like, let me put in a quick little patch in Nomad. It's not part of the actual Nomad distribution because as it turns out, like, Adding that parameter can have like weird repercussions that they have to explore further. But he was able to add this parameter just for the sake of our experiment so that we got it up and running. And then I had like a little sample app where I deployed. I just got like Jaeger running on Kubernetes, running on Nomad. And the way that I have Nomad running, there's this project called HashiCube, which is super cool. You can think of it as like, it's kind of like a desktop hashi in a box. And so it uses Vagrant to provision your hashi environment. So that includes Nomad Console Vault. And on M1 Max, of course, Big FU, you can't use virtual machines. So you can't use virtual box with Vagrant. It no worky. So the guy who created HashiCube, uh, Rian Nolan, he ported it to work with M1 Max by using the Docker provider for Vagrant. So I basically have the hashi stack running on Docker. And then I have Kubernetes in Docker and then deploying a Docker container of Jaeger running on this Kubernetes. So it's like three or four layers of Docker (laughs) running on this thing. And it was purely for funsies. But I was thinking like, what kind of applications could you possibly have with this weird ass setup? And I'm thinking maybe one useful thing is like, Kubernetes has like all these like cool operators available to it. And Nomad doesn't have the operator pattern in quite the same way. Like you can make operators for Nomad, but there's not like a defined API in the same way 
like you have in Kubernetes. So you have to like port stuff over yourself, like manually create these, these operators in Nomad, or you can run Kubernetes on Nomad and then run these operators on Kubernetes on Nomad. Interesting. So first and foremost, I'm not going to admit how many times I've built container images on my M1 Mac and sat there for two hours wondering why the heck they didn't work. Uh, but I will admit that I have done it more than once. So, <laughs> but Christine, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well here because my head is racing around the levels of abstraction, even <laughs> outside of like the multiple levels of Docker. What I'm thinking is Kubernetes handles networking very differently than Nomad does. It handles storage very differently than Nomad does. When Where you have this plugin model in Kubernetes, so you have your CNIs and your CSIs, you have plugins, I'm, I'm doing air yeah. quotes here, yeah, but yeah. You, you don't have the same model that Kubernetes follows. So uh, I'm curious, like, how did you get the basics of networking and storage running with that extra layer of abstraction on top or on bottom, however you're looking at it? I didn't have to do anything special for getting Nomad to run because I was using HashiCube, which all the magic has done for me behind the scenes. Didn't have to think about that. And then because k zeros was basically containerized, it was basically running a container in Nomad, which Nomad does well. So that was definitely not the problem. Really, it boiled down to it being like just some configuration flags of getting the container to play nice in Nomad. Got it. And I'm thinking about it from the other perspective of because Nomad has the ability to not just orchestrate and schedule containers, but also VMs, there's nothing stopping anybody from running uh, bootstrapping with KubeADM or MicroKS or whatever on a couple of VMs that's managed by Nomad. So ultimately, yeah. Nomad becomes this uh, platform engineering level of that abstraction where you're using Nomad for your platform. And then everything else is kind of being managed underneath one of those things being Kubernetes, which is an interesting concept. Sorry, Christine, I don't mean to take over the, the whole show here. It's just my head is racing. <laughs> no worries. I mean, I'm just listening. And what shall I say? There was like a very interesting combination that I didn't think I would hear one day that someone tried out. But that's what makes it fun being in tech, that we get to geek out with some very fun projects that are different from what you typically may expect. So that was a really interesting one and that you got it working and actually didn't experience that many challenges like Michael mentioned with networking and storage is quite cool. I need to accept yeah. that I haven't been using Nomad. I didn't get a chance yet or a use case where I would use it. And I would actually want to take a step back here because I think what may be confusing for many of the uh, listeners is that typically if you search for Nomad or if you look for like Nomad and Kubernetes, there is normally a versus in there. So you, yeah. it's typically being looked at as two different tools that will help you achieve more or less the same things. But Nomad can, for example, be more lightweight. It's a simple binary. And then you kind of get to orchestrate in the same way as with Kubernetes. Yeah. You get to orchestrate the virtual machines. But you can do that with Kubernetes as well, actually. Absolutely. So maybe you can help us and our audience to kind of clarify what is the difference here and why is there a versus? <laughs> between those two. Let me talk about the verses a little bit. So like, for example, the, the reason why I even started using Nomad, because I, I would have like, I grew up in Kubernetes land. I had heard of Nomad in the periphery and I was like, oh, cool. There's a thing that does a similar thing to Kubernetes. Um, but then a, a couple of jobs ago, I ended up finding myself managing a platform team that ran a hashi stack that included Nomad. So they weren't running Kubernetes. And it was because they were using like their own data centers. So they weren't in the cloud. It was all their, their own data center. And so they had already tried the Kubernetes experiment of trying to basically deploy a Kubernetes cluster in their own data center, which ouch. <laughs> and I think, I think they realized that was extremely painful. And so they're like, oh, let's try Nomad and see if that's better. And so for their use case, it made sense to deploy Nomad because it was 
much simpler to to roll out and maintain compared to rolling out and maintaining their own Kubernetes cluster. Now, if they had been using public cloud, I think the story would have probably changed a fair bit. But when you're using your own data center, it probably does make a lot of sense to go with a product like Nomad. That's how I started learning about Nomad because I'm like, well, I'm managing this team. I guess I should understand what the hell is going on. And I ended up uh, doing a whole blog series on just exploring Nomad because I'm like, well, I'm learning this stuff. I want to share this with the rest of the world so that other people who might be, you know, considering Nomad or or getting started with Nomad might find this useful, which launched into the whole idea of like, what are the differences, right? Because coming from a Kubernetes world, I'm like, I need to understand this in terms of something that I already understand, which is Kubernetes. So how do these things translate. So Christina, like you mentioned, it is uh, a single binary for Nomad. So you can run Nomad on your desktop if you want, whereas Kubernetes is a little more complicated, I guess a little less complicated with distros such as K0s, which also you can do the same sort of thing. But I guess the thing is like the Nomad that you get in, in your binary is the Nomad that you're going to be deploying to your data center. And it can act as both client and server, which is super cool. So it's just a matter of like setting the config files to tell it what its role is going to be. Now, one interesting thing about Nomad is that unlike Kubernetes, where everything is like rolled into one, right? Nomad, I think if you want the equivalent of what you have in Kubernetes and Nomad, it means you're actually running Nomad console and vaults. So then you've got Console serves as your key value store, but it also can serve as your service mesh and it's used for service discovery. And then Vault is used for managing secrets. Now we know that Console and Vault can also be used in Kubernetes, which is kind of cool. Um, the nice thing with Console and Vault in Nomad is that they are designed to play really nice with each other. So just to get those integrations going is a matter of setting some configs in your Nomad config files and away you go, which is super awesome. Now, Nomad does have also a few slightly different terms for certain things. So in Kubernetes, you have your YAML manifests. Um, in Nomad, if you're familiar at all with uh, Hashi products, they use HCL which is their own proprietary language, which I like to think of as like the love child between JSON and YAML. I find JSON is very hard to read. I love reading YAML and I feel like HCL is like that beautiful balance of like, it's forgiving in the way that JSON is, but organized in the way that YAML is. So there you have it, HCL. So, and the nice thing about um, when you define things, uh, so in, in YAML, you've got your HCL job specs and you have one job spec to define everything. It encompasses all the things, including doing your like your load balancer definitions or like your equivalent of config maps in, in Nomad, which is basically a template. All that stuff is like contained in one single HCL file. I mean, yes, technically you, you can string multiple YAMLs in the same YAML file in Kubernetes, but they are still separate YAML definitions, whereas this one is like a single encompassed HCL. Like all the definitions are, they're not separate like snippets of HCL that are stitched together like you would have in your Kubernetes manifest. So that's kind of nice. In uh, Kubernetes, you, you have your container runtime. In Nomad, you have what's called the task driver. And the task can be Pretty much anything under the sun, out of the box, I know for sure it supports like virtualization, it supports containerization. Um, you can run like standalone um, Java virtual machines, IIS, you, you can run those like standalone in Nomad. That's one thing that's uh, super awesome about Nomad that we've talked about earlier. Um, in Kubernetes, our smallest deployable unit is the pod. In Nomad, the smallest deployable unit is called a task, but you have a task group, which encompasses multiple tasks. So like they're similar concepts, but they're different. So like your, your pod has multiple containers, your task group has multiple tasks, mm. um, but the smallest unit in Kubernetes is the pod and the smallest unit in Nomad is the task. So they're, they kind of exist at different levels. 
And then the concept of, of services exists in uh, both Kubernetes and Nomad. They're just a little bit different um, as to how you configure them. Like in Kubernetes, like you you have like your, I mean, in both of them, you you have your standard service definitions and then you you plug in like your, your API gateway or, or whatever. And it's just different in how you implement it. And I believe Nomad now also supports CSI like storage drivers. So that's kind of nice newish to Nomad. I, I, don't, I guess it's not quite so new. And then Nomad has a concept similar to Helm charts. They have something called Nomad Packs. So if you're familiar with the syntax for Helm charts, um, it's very, very similar syntax. I think it's based on Go templating as well. So it's not too much of a stretch if you worked with one to work with the other. Could I think of task groups like namespaces? No, it's funny because a task group is, is basically like a pod, but the mm. difference is the task group is not the smallest deployable unit. It's the task. Oh, okay. Got it. Because a, a task contains like, that's where you define your container. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So, so like I would have, you know, let's say one or more containers in my pod, I would have one or more tasks in my task group. Got it. That is exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay, cool. So here's the thing, like when I'm thinking about Nomad and Kubernetes, nowadays, I feel like I'm thinking from a platform perspective of how to manage it all in one place and how to perform as many abstractions as possible to make everybody's lives easier. Um, if I'm running Nomad, let's say in a data center, like this makes total sense because out of the box, Nomad gives you the ability to manage containers and VMs. It reminds me, from that perspective, it reminds me very much of the days of when I was managing a bunch of VMs out of the Hyper-V console or out of the, the vSphere console. Like That's kind of what it reminds me of in that sense. I know it's drastically different, but that's where my head kind of goes. So because it's out of the box, it makes sense. But then when we're thinking about Kubernetes, and by the way, for everybody listening, I do not want to, I'm not making this a Kubernetes versus Nomad show because uh, that's not what I'm getting at. But what I'm I'm getting at is with Kubernetes, you can use like Kubevert, for example, to kind of do this similar thing. So then in that case, like, would there ever be a reason in your opinion to, let's say, for example, have Kubernetes running in Nomad and then Kubernetes running something like Kubevert to have the ability to manage separate VMs outside of like maybe some things are running Kubernetes specifically, other things are running, uh, you know, uh, legacy stuff on VMs. Like, could there be this thing of where Nomad is kind of sitting at the top and Nomad is, you know, the puppet master, so to speak, and Kubernetes is, you know, the puppeteers? Yeah, I could definitely see that because Nomad has that added flexibility where anything that you can dream of orchestrating, you can do it. So it, it has like obviously supported types of tasks that out of the box, right? But it has a plugin system where if you want to write your own plugin for like mm -hmm. WebAssembly, you could. Whatever tickles your fancy, right? So that's kind of the nice thing. And as far as I know, I don't think you have that kind of flexibility with Kubernetes. So then I, I think it makes it a very compelling use case for having like Nomad as, as your puppet master. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think the closest thing you would get is like the operator model of extending the API. Um, but yeah, that makes sense. Do you think using Nomad as a um, puppeteer, <laughs> that it would reduce the complexity of Kubernetes that so many are talking about? <laughs> I think so because like that was one of the things like when I when I went from Kubernetes world to to Nomad world I'm like oh my god there like it is definitely a lot less in complexity like the learning curve for Nomad was a lot lower especially I think as a developer if you just want to like get on with deploying your jobs quickly like I think that's pretty simple I don't know how it would fare for you know an SRE team managing a nomad cluster. I, I mean, if we're if we're talking about managing your own nomad cluster versus managing your own Kubernetes cluster in a data center, then I think nomad still ends up being easier. But if you're comparing to managing your own nomad cluster in a data center to like managed Kubernetes in some public cloud somewhere, I think the managed Kubernetes ends up winning to a certain extent, right? Because that's less for you to worry about. I mean, there's always like, whenever there's cluster upgrades, there are issues. So I don't want to downplay that. But I do think there are a few conveniences that we we take for granted with, with managed Kubernetes that we don't get with, with managed Nomad. And uh, from speaking with my friend at HashiCorp, it doesn't look like there's any move to do a managed uh, Nomad service. 
I would assume the opposite. Yeah, I know, right? Because everything else is on, on like, you know, the hashy cloud, like you can get right. like Vault on the cloud and Terraform on the cloud and all that. I could perhaps see the play there if HashiCorp wants to perhaps turn Nomad into something for on-prem and for data centers and from a management mm-hmm. perspective like that. That's strange. I wouldn't I wouldn't see any other reason to not. But anyways, yeah, this is really cool. I, I think that this is something that I definitely want to try out in my lab environment as well. And I encourage everybody else to try it out too. And I say lab environment because correct me if I'm wrong, but this idea wouldn't exactly be production ready yet, right? No, I, I definitely not production ready, especially not with that config. That's, you know, the, the hacky version of, of Nomad that my, my friend put out is not part of like the actual Nomad distribution. So for anyone who wants to try it out, I do have a blog post detailing all the gory details on how to do it. So definitely check it out <laughs> if you're interested in messing around with it and having the, oh my God, it's like Inception for containers. <laughs> yes, yeah, if we'll you're totally on the lookout for a fun challenge, you could. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You could totally yeah. try something like this. Out. <laughs> hey, try it with a different distro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. I even wonder, like the the smaller form factor Kubernetes provisioners, like micro KS. I wonder how it would work mm-hmm. from that perspective. It would definitely make sense. I mean. I think that direction that we're kind of going in right now, and Christina and I have been talking about this for a while, and on DevOps and Docker Talk podcast, Brendan Burns was on whenever, but the the episode came out a couple days ago, and he was even saying, like, you know, the future of Kubernetes sounds more or less like managing it from this new, well, not new, but this concept of platform engineering and abstracting as much as possible. And I think that Nomad, from this perspective, could very much help out with that. And I think that that's even a great play for HatchyCorp, to be honest, because they definitely want more adoption of Nomad. It's no secret that there's not as much adoption for Nomad than there is for Kubernetes right now. Mm -hmm. And I Mm -hmm. think that this would definitely help that adoption because I even think about all these different scenarios of simply getting a Kubernetes cluster up and running. And, you know, again, from a platform engineering perspective, my head goes to things like cluster API. So cluster API gives you the ability to literally just run a couple commands and you have a Kubernetes cluster up and running. You don't have to worry about anything else. It's all declarative. So you're doing it via YAML and you're just calling mm-hmm. that YAML via one command. That's it. So that gives you the ability to take that need away from engineers and developers that don't know Kubernetes inside and out, but they need a cluster, but they don't know how to deploy one. And and this could even, you know, the whole idea of running it in Nomad could even take it up a level. And just like you said, have some simple HCL that you know you run and boom your your clusters are up and running with all of your configurations and maybe you got a little argo in there maybe you got a little service mesh whatever you have mm-hmm. going on you yeah, kind yeah, of just yeah. have this hcl and it's kind of up and running and even taking it a step further it would be nice if you know if HashiCorp would go in a direction like this, it would be even nice to see, for example, the ability to have some type of uh, HCL converter. So if I'm writing in Go and I don't want to learn HCL, because again, we want to take abstractions, right? Like we want to take the need for developers to have to learn everything and anything and engineers to learn everything and anything. If I'm writing in Go or in Python or JS or whatever, it would be nice to like have that converter and then it converts to HCL and then it kind of does its thing in the background. So... I could definitely see this from a theoretical perspective blowing up into something much larger. I totally agree with you. Like it, it's interesting because one of the things that my team was doing my two jobs ago, so I was I was working at Two Cows, and they were developing basically an internal platform engineering tool for helping teams bootstrap onto the Nomad cluster. So it would make it easy to, because in, in, in Nomad, similar to Kubernetes, right, you can add like new nodes to it. And so like any team that wanted to be in on the on-prem cluster, they developed a tool that would create and configure a client node, and it would have all of the configurations that they needed, including like all of the networking stuff, like all the standardized vault configurations so that it would, you know, it'd be a very opinionated way to create a Nomad client node and add it to the enterprise cluster and make it in a way so that it wasn't painful for developers to to get added onto the cluster, right? 
the VM would still be theirs, but it would be pre-configured with all the stuff that they needed. And they did that by using like the, the various um, Nomad APIs. So they wrote the whole tool and go and created like this nice CLI for it. And it was super, super cool. And I, I, you know, it makes me think that I feel like there's this whole untapped market for HashiCorp in just platform engineering tools for Nomad. Like there's so much of that stuff already for Kubernetes, right? Everything under the sun, which I really appreciate in the Kubernetes ecosystem. There's always some cool new tool um, to check out. Um, and Nomad doesn't have as much TLC when it comes to that. Even even stuff like, you know, managing deployments, like a tool similar to Argo CD, right? For, mm -hmm. for Nomad, I think the closest that they have is Waypoint, which I played with at the end of, I want to say, 2021. And it was like similar-ish in what it could do uh, in what um, Argo CD could do as far as like, hey, there's this you know, group of services that go together so we can deploy them together and then we can destroy them together if we want to remove them from our cluster. But I'd be curious to see how much Waypoint has evolved since I last played with it. And apparently it runs also on, on uh, Kubernetes, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think it would be interesting to see more tools like that on in, in the Nomad landscape, because um, I think that could be more compelling to get more folks to use it. But I, I think you're right also in the, you know, this is not a versus thing. It it ends up being like, whatever suits your organization, right? Where does your knowledge lie? Um, what's easier in terms of managing these things? What tools are available to you? It shouldn't be this like horrid battle um, of like my tool is better than yours. No, right. it's whatever tool suits you to get the damn job done. Yeah, I guess this is what it kind of ends up in. When you are behind a single tool, you try to create ways to get more attention to your tool. And that's where this versus uh, term comes out. And yeah. uh, other organizations building on top of that tool, uh, for instance, or abstracting uh, the tool's functionality would use this as well in terms of advertising for uh, getting attention to their products. So I guess it is important to clarify concepts like that. That for those who do a simple search to figure out where I could benefit from the tool like Nomad, and then they get all this information saying that this is like, you should use that instead of Kubernetes, but it is not necessarily given mm -hmm. depending on what situation you're in. And uh, what I find interesting about Nomad as well, when I was reading a bit about it, I also saw that there were quite cool uh, challenges they've done in terms of scaling, um, where they've been comparing like how much the Nomad uh, cluster could scale in terms of nodes and containers. And they had like a, they were able to get up to 2 million containers running on mm. 10,000 nodes uh, in production, which I find it was pretty cool uh, to yeah. see what the, how to the tool can be <laughs> maxed yeah, out. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was quite, uh, quite impressive. Uh, yeah, that's crazy. I, you know, one of the things that comes to mind, especially with this conversation, and I think with conversations that engineering teams are constantly having right now is it's always about bringing in something that's going to make everybody's life easier. What ends up happening is you have all these vendors and all these platforms and all these tools, and they're making all of these things for good reason to make engineers' lives easier. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is, is that now engineers have to learn 55 different tools just to get everything running in a particular way. But some engineers like that because they get to pick and choose. They get to, you know, not be locked in. But then at the same time, there are complaints because they have to learn everything and anything. And it's really hard to keep all that knowledge in your head for just one team. And I totally agree. Now, flipping it in reverse, everybody wants an easy way. Everybody wants one one thing, one stack that they can just say, boom, here it all is. Here's my Kubernetes environment. Everything is w where it needs to be. And boom, we're done. And that's what the Hashi stack could ultimately provide in this scenario. But then you're going to have complaints that we're locked into a vendor. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, you, you, you can't have it both ways. You got to pick your poison. You got to pick one or the other. You either got to stay up to date with a million tools or you got to pick one stack, one provider that's going to give it all to you, but understand you're going to be, you know, air quote locked in. So it's, and, and, and I feel like this is like a constant debate, but 
it's more like pick which solution just works best for you. Yeah, totally. And, you know, like talking more about the vendor locking thing, I, I don't think there's such thing as not being locked into a vendor as mm-hmm. much as we aspire to that. I mean, even say you've got Kubernetes in Azure and then you want to do Kubernetes in AWS. Great. Yep. You can port some of that stuff over, but there are some stuff you can't port over. And, you know, like you're always going to be beholden to yep. to something. And I think it's a matter of just accepting that fate and being okay with mm-hmm. it. Knowing that, yeah, there, like if you move over, there's going to be some pain regardless, maybe a little bit less pain, but there's still going to be some pain. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you uh, 1000%. And I, I say that all the time from that same perspective. I even I had a conversation the other day and I was I was saying that exact thing, like there's no such thing. You're, you're locked in somewhere to something mm-hmm. and somebody mentioned open telemetry and they were like, well, with open telemetry, we can put it in the middle and we can use Prometheus and this tool and that tool and it all connects to one place and then it sends all the information wherever it needs to go. And then my response was, okay, so now you're locked into open telemetry. You're, <laughs> you're locked into something either way. You, you, you just got to kind of pick your poison. Uh, yeah, so no, I, I totally agree with you. The, the reason that I bring up the vendor um, lock-in thing, so to speak, with the air quotes is just because like you're either picking one stack or you're multiple stacks. Either way, you're picking something. It's just a matter of like, do you want to stress out about, uh-oh, what if this vendor goes away? Or do you want to stress out about, uh-oh, what if one of my 55 tools breaks and I had to go pick a 56? Or you decide to create your own tool and replacement <laughs> for every single vendor to avoid lock-in and then you end yep. up in... Uh, in a huge amount of technical oh debt. So yeah. it's all about the balance, I guess, and the requirements you have in your specific organization. It's so, so true. I see organizations do that as well, where they're like, you know what? We're just going to create everything ourselves. And it's like, okay, great. You can do that and you can maintain it and it'll be great. But understand that you're going to have 10 to 15 engineers and they are all going to be 150 to 200,000 a year USD. So if you're okay with spending millions in salaries, that's fine. You could do that. You're going to be spending the money either way. You're either spending it on tools, you're spending it on people, you're spending it on both. Uh, there's there's no way to get away from it. Yeah. So there's there's always like a pro and a con to everything. And I think it ultimately comes down to like what your organization, it's just easier for your organization. Like I remember when serverless came out. And serverless, I feel like, did not pick up as much steam as everybody assumed. Uh, I know it's popular and stuff, but I feel like it's just like not as talked about um, compared to everything else. And I remember when serverless came out, I always, I thought it was such a cool concept because the whole idea was you're a developer, you write code, you don't want to worry about infrastructure. You don't want to worry about managing and handling all of that stuff. Just pop your code into this service and boom, your application's running and it's scaling and it's working as expected. Now, we all found out later that that's simply not how serverless works, unfortunately. But the concept of that is like exactly what we need. Like we just need something where it's like push your stuff through, press a couple buttons, write a little bit of code boom, and you're off to the races. And to your point, I think that's what the whole idea of having Nomad at the top and having the rest of the Hashi stack, I think that we could get pretty darn close. Yeah, totally. Living the dream. One of these days we'll we'll have like something that's relatively easy to manage. <laughs> and then someone will create yet another level of abstraction to it. <laughs> I feel like there's this whole industry of like, you know, we have tool X. Awesome. This is a great tool. Now let's create a level of abstraction to that because this tool is too complicated. (laughs) Yep. Yep. I think that's exactly what happened with Kubernetes. Unfortunately, the whole idea was, Hey, we could just schedule our containers. And now it's like, Hey, there are over a thousand tools in the CNCF landscape, but yep. (laughs) Here we are. Cool. So before wrapping up here, Christina, do you have any uh, last questions that you'd like to dive into or any statements or anything like that? No, I think uh, maybe just if I were to test it out for myself to kind of see if I will uh, be as skilled to complete this challenge, uh, is there anything 
specific I should be aware of before I start or you have outlined kind of the whole process in uh, in a blog series that you mentioned or anything that would be useful to know in order to test it for yourself? I hope I outlined everything in, in the blog post, including all the gotchas and the stupid things that I did to... Uh... The secret patch, is the, it uh, yeah. available? Oh, the, uh, yeah, the secret, yeah, I have a link to the secret patch. Awesome. Um, yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I have I have a repo. Um, so one of the things that I like doing for fun, because I'm a CNCF ambassador, which I believe both of you are as well, right? I'm, I'm not. No, Christina. Oh, you're not. Michael yeah. soon, hopefully. Oh, <laughs> We're oh, rooting awesome. for him. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm a CNCF ambassador, but I'm also a HashiCorp ambassador. And I got that because of the work that I was doing on Nomad, like exploring things. Um, it forced me to like, oh, this tool is available on, on Kubernetes. Well, I wanted to work on so I have a repo in, in my GitHub called Nomad Conversions, where I've taken a few different tools that work on Kubernetes and have ported them to Nomad. Basically, as long as they don't have an operator attached to them, it's just a straight up conversion. If it's like, if it just has a YAML manifest, I convert it to HCL to the job specs. So yeah, I've got a bunch of, of stuff on there. And I have a blog post also talking about how to convert your YAML manifest to uh, HCL for anyone who wants to play around with Nomad. And I definitely recommend like running HashiCube on your machine for exploring this. I mean, you can run this on Nomad standalone as well, but HashiCube is nice because it simulates what you would see in a data center. So one of the cool things um, that I had in my previous job is like, if I wanted to test something out, go on HashiCube, and then I could port it over to the data center. And I really wouldn't need to make any changes to my to my HCL, which is amazing. <laughs> I mean, we've seen <laughs> that is not something that you get by running, you know, kind or K0s and then porting <laughs> that stuff over to your, you know, managed Kubernetes somewhere. So yeah, it's a very, very cool tool. Awesome. Yeah, I gotta check that out too, actually. All righty. So Adrian, at this point, I would love to give you the opportunity to plug away. I know you do your blogs, but if you have any books or any other content or, or, or anything at all that you'd like to plug away, please feel free to do so. I'm currently working on an O'Reilly video course on observability with open telemetry. So that's a work in progress. I believe it'll be out sometime in 2024. Uh, if anyone likes to learn via video with, you know, um, hands-on labs, this may be the course for you. I used to have a podcast called On Call Me Maybe that has wrapped up after two seasons. And I have just started up a new podcast called Geeking Out, <laughs> which I've recorded a bunch of episodes. It hasn't launched yet but uh looking to launch this fall so keep an eye out nice very very cool awesome well thank you so much for coming on really appreciate it christina as always thank you so much for making the show 10 times better than just me doing it by myself <laughs> Oh, you're so nice, Michael. Please continue. <laughs> thank you. And awesome. Likewise, it's awesome hosting it with you. And thank you, Adriana, for coming in. And thanks to all the listeners. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thank you both. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.